Home Keepers. So glad to be here, so glad you're there. And welcome, welcome one and all. Maybe this is the first time you've seen the program. Please, please hang around. I'm very, very confident that you're going to enjoy this program today and learn a lot because I have a return guest and it's been way too long since he's been here and I promise to never let it happen again, not to let that much time go between his visits here to Home Keepers. His name is Dr. Tom Woodward and boy, where do you start with him? He's a professor, he's a author, uh, he's written a book on the epigenome. I'm sure you all know what that is, but we'll ask him about it. Uh, he's an expert on apologetics and evolution as it uh, versus creationism. I could talk to this man all day long, but I'm glad he's here and going to be with us for a little while. And I just welcome him back. And uh, like I said before, I'm not going to wait that long before he's back uh, to bless your hearts again. And um, Stephanie are going to make Stephanie and I are going to make a, it's called a holiday breakfast bake. And this is one I think you'll really want in your little recipe library. Oh my, I don't think I'll say any more. We'll just show you what it is, okay? Uh, before I join her though, I want to again offer you the book, The Miracle of Faith Goals. And as I went through this, I wondered really, um, how many people in their personal life have a goal, set a goal, and then they really work to incorporate faith in it. It's maybe we leave that for the ministry, I don't know. But the gentleman who wrote this is a really good friend of mine, Pastor Dave Williams, and the uh, founder of uh, Hope Church in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, um, no, it's not, it's uh, Mount Hope Church. And he took the church when it was really, really tiny and began to build, and he's a man of faith, preaches faith, and he has left the church now into a broader ministry. He was there 30 years. Now listen to this. In that 30-year span, that local church gave $40 million to the cause of missions. That's more than a million bucks a year, friends, and... It is because they believed, they made faith promises, and God came through every time. And so this isn't just for the ministry. This is for your personal, personal life where you need faith in any part of your life uh, where it's lacking. So if you would like to have this book, and I really want to encourage you to order it, for that gift of at least $15, we'll send it to you. That's quite a bargain, actually. And uh, that includes the shipping and handling. And if any of you deal in shipping and handling, it is out of sight these days, the cost. So <clears throat> take advantage of this um, offer because it will be limited. If you use your credit card, that number's on your screen, 1-800-229-0059. Or write to me at Home Keepers, and Stephanie's going to give you that address. Yes, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. That is so good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and this stuff smells so good. It does smell uh -huh. so delicious. So tell them what you're doing. Okay, <clears throat> I have a package of sausage, and I have some onions and green peppers that I've just sautéed. Mm -hmm. You, we've. We've cut the, the recipe in half yes. because this sh should have fed 12. We don't need to make that big of a batch, so we're serving six. So if you order it, we will make note of that, that yes. you're getting the big recipe. And you can and cut it in half. you don't want to feed 12 people. Right. Or you can, you can make the whole batch and do two pans and freeze one mm -hmm. for later. Mm -hmm. Do a little freezer cooking. I got a letter from a lady that she really appreciates all your little tips. Well, that's nice. And we were talking before the show. <clears throat> of all the wonderful helps for homekeepers today. I just remember growing up in the ministry, my parents had a two bedroom home, four kids, and my mother, wow. you know, she cooked three times a day. She, that's when they um, starched the clothes and hung mm -hmm, them out on the mm -hmm. clothesline and yes, then sprinkled them and then all of those things. There's so many helps yes. for homekeepers today. Yes. And like this girl tries to tell you, if you just get organized, organization it's not, is huge. You don't have to whine and say you're overworked all right, the time. Right, right, right. 
Okay, mm. what am I doing here? Okay, you're making, you have milk, you have a cup of milk, you have a cup of Bisquick, and you have a couple eggs that you're gonna whisk mm -hmm. up together. And okay, this, this a it's a half a cup, but. Yeah. Um, well, no, I, no right. that was a cup, oh, was it a half a cup of Bisquick? You're right, you're right. Mm -hmm. You are right. Because we're making half of it. <laughs> it's and all we're, very confusing. We're confusing everybody. <laughs> and then you can put the eggs, eggs. in there okay. too. And I'm just gonna, you sprayed this pan real good, which mm -hmm. you know is our rule. Ouch. I just burned my finger. <laughs> <laughs> the handle is there for a purpose. Yeah, I went a little too far up. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this in here, get all the yummy goodness in Remember there. that program we made a couple of time, a couple of days ago and we both sliced our fingers. Yeah, I'm just healing from we that. We sacrificed for yeah. this show. That was my birthday show and that night I got to hold my grandson finally That's for the first right. time. He was three weeks old, which was way too long to wait. Well, she was sick when he was born. Yes, so I she didn't really get to sick. hold him. And then I got to see him and I got to see the three older grandchildren. So it just totally made my birthday complete. I love brand new babies. Oh, I sat and held him the whole entire time I <laughs> ate. Like I'm holding him and I'm trying to eat over on the side don't, so I don't spill anything on him, but I wasn't about to give him up because I that was the first time they I got to hold the him. They make the cutest sounds and faces. Oh, and he was stretching and, and uh -huh. squeaking. Okay, so this is frozen, frozen hash browns mm -hmm. I'm gonna put in there. I have some cheese that we're gonna put in there. And then super easy, all we're gonna do is take the mixture that you made, which was the Bisquick and the milk uh -huh. and the eggs. Pour that on top of it. Yep. Let me get this mixed up real good here. And you keep a little bit of cheese out mm -hmm. and, and just the last couple minutes, put it on the top and there you go. And your idea to make the whole thing and freeze one. Yes. And you know, you could put red peppers in here. You could put, you know, a variety of things that suit your taste. I'd like to know who the first person was that figured out you could throw Bisquick in these things and not I be. would love to know who that was, yes. Mm -hmm. Because we bless you. Yes. We honor you. So then you just bake it, and then you put uh -huh. cheese in at the end and bake it for and a few more your fork. minutes. Okay. And this is going to be my lunch. Mmm. That's good, isn't it? Mmm. What a great combination. Mmm. Mm -hmm. We did good. We don't that have, is delicious. We don't have to redeem ourselves on this. No. Sometimes we do. We've done really good. We haven't Recently, had a redemption show in a while. Now you watch, know, watch <laughs> the next show. Something's going to happen. But you know what else, <laughs> what else you can tell is how quickly the director and the audio man get here after yes. the show. That, well, they're no that's dummies. how we can tell yeah. we're successful. Okay, friends. Information is coming up on the screen. If you want this recipe, and let me tell you, you do want this recipe. And... Um, then if you haven't met Tom Woodward, I tell you, he's one of the most interesting people ever come around. Glad he's here, so stay around and meet him if you haven't. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. Welcome back, Tom. It's great to be back. Oh, I'm so glad you're back. And you're a very busy man, trotting around the world and all, but we can't let this happen again. I will make sure it doesn't. Mm -hmm. i uh, trying to think how far back we go, at least 25 years, maybe more. We moved back from the Dominican Republic. My wife and I were missionaries there mm -hmm. for about two, two and a half years. We returned the summer of 86, excuse okay. me, 88. Is that when you started coming here? And that's about the time, uh, within a year, I found myself coming onto your show, and mm -hmm. that was lots of fun. Mm -hmm. And the intelligent design movement was just exploding. It was getting mm -hmm. off the ground and beginning to soar to new heights. And God was revealing his, this, the, his fingerprints on nature's, um, you know, might say outside skin. The, the innards of the cell were becoming visible, mm -hmm. and people, especially scientists, were saying, wow. How could this evolve? It's uh, it's just been so exciting to watch it, mm -hmm. and uh, through the years we've watched really where the evolution quote science is, is crumbling. It's it's like a sinking Titanic. Uh -huh. Okay, it's a proud ship, and instead of taking us to the promised land, it's you know the, of of scientific understanding, it's sinking to the bottom of the sea as we speak. 
I've mentioned before on this the movie Expelled. Mm -hmm. Remember that? And the last scene where scientist Dawkins. Yes. Uh, what's his first Richard name? Richard Dawkins. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Ben Stein mm -hmm. asked him, because he said everything, everything goes back to one cell. He mm -hmm. took us back to the one cell. And Ben Stein said, and uh, where did that come from? And he said, we didn't know. So Guess what? They still don't know. Don't know. <laughs> okay, five years later, uh, since the Expelled movie yeah, came out. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, been, it's been thrilling to watch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've done a good job of bringing, certainly to Tampa Bay and the other place you've gone, uh, people who are sharp in apologetics and also in uh, creationism. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got something coming up in the Tampa Bay area. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit in uh, March the 21st, 21st through the 20, 22nd. Mm -hmm. Let's put that on the screen and uh, please um, note that your uh, speaker is, uh, your main speaker is Lee Strobel. All speakers, all the other speakers you have are top notch. But We're blessed. Uh, mm -hmm. Josh McDowell's son, Sean McDowell, mm -hmm. who is a fantastic uh, apologetics expert in his own right, is coming. Uh, we have Craig Hazen, a nationally known apologist. But the coming of Lee Strobel to Tampa Bay, it's like a national conference. Mm -hmm. People can literally come over from mm -hmm. any part of the United States or even foreign countries and enjoy two amazing days. Uh, Josh, uh, his son, Sean McDowell will be speaking both days. Uh, Lee Strobel will be speaking on Friday night mm -hmm. and he'll actually stay around uh, on Sunday morning. He'll be speaking at the same location, Calvary Church. Uh, and I think we'll go ahead and put your website up and we'll leave it mm -hmm. up the whole time. And you can go there and find out more information about this conference, but also uh, the other things that uh, Professor Woodward is involved in. I'm thinking of apologetics. It's kind of sad that it needs all this attention. Shouldn't we just learn that in Sunday school <laughs> and VBS and everything? Are, are the, does the local church not do a real great job? Well, uh, let me be as positive as I can. Okay. okay? Uh, some churches are catching fire. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for example, just the DVDs that feature Lee Strobel. One is called Case for Christ, mm -hmm. and that was followed up by Case for Faith, and then Case for a Creator. All three of those DVDs are beyond spectacular. I mean, on a five-star scale, these mm -hmm. are pushing 10 stars. Mm -hmm. And so some, I actually spoke just a few minutes before this, bro this broadcast, uh, one of the pastors said, oh, wow, Lee Strobel is coming to Tampa Bay? Mm -hmm. I want to bring my whole church. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of a turned on, on fire mm -hmm. for truth church. And if we're not building, C.S. Lewis himself said, mm -hmm. and of course our organization named after mm -hmm. him, C.S. Lewis Society, and so C.S. Lewis himself said, if we're not built on the truth of Christ, we don't have a foundation. We don't. And so, so when people ask, how do we even know there was such a person as Christ? I say, welcome that question. And we have the answers. The even secular history wrote about Christ. How do we know that the first cell didn't evolve? We have overwhelming evidence now mm -hmm. that shows that, the, again, the signature of divine intelligence is all written in the DNA. And so to me, the opportunity to have Lee Strobel here the weekend of March 21st, 22nd is unparalleled in the 25 years history of the C.S. Lewis Society. I read his first book and uh, he was, was he an agnostic or? He was an agnostic. An, an attorney? Who, he was actually, he got a law degree from Yale. Uh -huh. So having, being a Princeton grad, I won't hold that against him. <laughs> okay, there's a little rivalry. But uh, he got a law degree from Yale and he became, as an agnostic, actually a full-blown atheist, uh, correct that. Mm -hmm. He became the top editor on, and crime reporter and then later editor at the Chicago Tribune. And his wife attended a Bible study for women at uh, Willow Creek, mm -hmm. big church uh, there on the right. north side of Chicago. She came to Christ. He was shocked. He was appalled. He said, I, I, know, I wasn't signing on to this when I <laughs> married you. you know, and so she, he actually dared to bring his little reporter's pad and sat in the audience for some months mm -hmm. trying to find a hole yeah, in what the, the preacher was bringing. And he couldn't, and he said, I got to investigate this, and spent almost two full years investigating. The whole story is compelling. Yeah. He'll be sharing yeah. that story on Friday night, March 21st. I do remember 21st. that, yeah. It's in the Case for Christ book. Case for Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, I want to go back over some of your stuff. Um, when I first met you, you were a professor at Trinity College, mm -hmm. and uh, taught a Sunday school class. I kept hearing about that here because some of the people mm -hmm. attended it. And and uh, at what what uh, year did you establish the C.S. Lewis Society? Shortly after I began teaching at Trinity College. Of course, Trinity College of Florida is a Bible college. I think some people may have heard of Billy Graham, our, our yeah, alum, alumnus. I think, I I think have. you've heard of him. Mm -hmm. 
So Billy Graham class of 1940, but when we were uh, moving into the Newport Ritchie area, the north headwaters of Trinity uh, area of Tampa Bay, uh, I was excited to be able to teach at a national Bible college. And so I asked the, the leadership there, could we start a, a ministry, like a mission board that was geared towards skeptics, uh, atheists, you know, agnostics, whatever kind of person doubts the, the truth of God or, or mm -hmm. Christ. And then I said, could we also reach out to students and professors on other campuses? And of course, the, the Trinity College administration was very, very happy. Sure. Uh, they were like, they were excited and, and really on the uh, edge of what can we do? How can we help you? So since then, we've added a fossil museum and uh, fossils and minerals that, that display the glory of God. Why the name? I'm CS, sorry? Why well, the name? CS because Lewis. after I accepted Christ uh, at the end of my freshman year in college, again, it was a very hostile to faith campus. Princeton University is not known you, anymore. Were you an atheist? I was an atheist uh -huh. my freshman year, and I was an ardent evolutionist. I mean, I was an on-fire Darwin guy. Yay. <laughs> and so when I heard students studying this Christian thing, I thought, I've got to stop them. And they wound up, you know, through uh, older and younger graduates sharing the gospel with me. I'd never heard it clearly in my life. After I struggled with this for six months, I did wow. come to faith. I was still a Darwinist. I said, Lord, I'm still a Darwinist. I hope that's okay. <laughs> and God says, mm, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Later. <laughs> so within two months, I realized the evidence really does point to a, a spectacularly beautiful, complex creation. The fossil evidence doesn't show the transitions. And that's what we have in our little fossil uh, display at the college. And so at that point, I, I said, uh, you know, I want to study this and went on to Dallas Seminary, studied uh, my master's degree after a stint in the Air Force. And then when I got the opportunity to came to Trinity, they said, let's bring you in, teach missions, teach apologetics, and why don't you get your doctorate? So a, a Christian uh, ministry helped me to get my doctorate mm -hmm. in the rhetoric of science, University of South Florida, across the Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was able to really work in this area of intelligent design and write the whole history of it. And that was such a blessing. Yeah, and it's been great for me to just sit here on the sidelines and, and watch all of this Watch the Lord open doors. Now, you spoke on um, intelligent design, and that's kind of another word for creationism. Well, creationism tries to blend or, or show the fit of scientific evidence with the Bible. Intelligent design is more um, like a traveling light. It has less stuff to prove. So intelligent designs is the study of nature uh, using logic and evidence to identify this or that must have been designed. So it's, it's, you might say, minimalistic, but it's very powerful because you don't have to uh, consult any holy literature. Mm -hmm. You just use the evidence and you use logic. Yeah, scientific evidence. Yeah, scientific mm -hmm. evidence. And so the leading scientists in the world, most of them happen to be you know, Judeo-Christians, most of them are Christians, but they, they use strictly scientific evidence mm -hmm. to make their point. Then when they go outside that lab or that lecture hall, mm -hmm. they will use other evidence to identify who the creator is, mm -hmm. biblical evidence, for example. Yeah, now you spoke, was it in a university in Russia? This, this, in, or right Ukraine? next door in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is an area where they've never, ever been taught anything except evolution. Five universities in Kharkov, the leading uh, east, eastern city in Ukraine, five different universities opened up their lecture rooms to me and every place I went, they said, we've never heard any evidence right. of intelligent design. How did they respond? They were shocked. They were uh, stunned and sometimes. Uh, one, uh, one very angry professor tried to stop, almost intervene to stop my lecture. And we engaged in a dialogue, and that was a very good thing. Uh -huh. Because he had never studied the area of the DNA patterns that can only, that show that they're only an intelligence. It's like mm -hmm. a computer code. It's like the hard drive of any average laptop computer, except the DNA in our cells is about a million times more complex and, and information rich than a hard drive of a modern computer. It's astounding. That's where the layer upon layer upon layer of information in the epigenome becomes really staggering. I think it takes a whole lot more faith to believe that it just happened. I do not have enough faith to be an atheist, no. I'm uh, sorry. No. I, I can't manage I the leaps of faith. Okay, you was it you and Dr. Gills who wrote a book on the epigenome? Dr. Dr. Gills opened the door, and we call it the mysterious epigenome. Uh, Craigle published it. Which uh, is beyond DNA, the, right? Be, beyond, sitting literally kind of like a, a man on a horse. So the horse is the DNA. The epigenome is like the rider of the horse. Uh, the, the, the genome... <laughs> it takes it, my breath away. Yeah, the genome is like the orchestra. The, the epigenome is the director and, and the musical sheets that the orchestra follows. 
because on our DNA is arrayed literally millions of little switches. They're like dimmer controls. I know a lot of us have mm -hmm. a dining room with all those yep. circular dimmer controls. And these, uh, sometimes I call them flags or tags that are attached to the DNA are like dimmer switches. And every one of the 200 cell types, a brain cell versus a skin cell versus a heart cell, every cell has its own unique uh, arrangement of dimmer switches. So you have not just the DNA information package, you have 200 other information packages arrayed on top of the DNA, mm. depending on what cell type you have. And that's just like the first stage of five stages. Does this give that um, evolutionist, Darwinist, mm. does this give them pause like? I think it gives them chills that. at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what exactly. They just, uh, often you'll hear like our, our best people are working on that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the scientists are, are really um, are working hard to solve this problem. Well, to me, it's not less a gap in knowledge where we just haven't figured it out. It's a mountain of information. We have kind of a, a, a Mount Everest accumulating there of, of data that point to a brilliant, I mean beyond brilliant architect or designer of this informational system that we call the cell. Is this what senators call natural selection? Did Be you say senators? Yes, because... <laughs> Which senator in the U.S. Senate are we referring to? Okay, when they were... Um, I, in, this is an interesting question. Yeah, they were interviewing somebody for the Supreme Court. And I think it was Joe oh, Biden. Oh, okay. And it's my... The, what I got from it, if, if you believe in God, if you believe in creationism, you know, you shouldn't be on the court. That's the impression I got. Well, you know, one of my Princeton classmates, uh, you know, is is uh, Sam Alito, is on the Supreme Court. Oh, really? Yeah, he and, he and I were buddies in ROTC. I like him. I've yes. only seen him on TV. Yeah, I've only seen him on TV too <laughs> since since we graduated. <laughs> but uh, but you know, it's it's. I would say any candidate for the Supreme Court uh, would almost, for prudential or practical reasons, have to you know, say no comment on their religious affiliation, sad to say, mm -hmm. uh, because that almost, you know, marks you, well, this, oh, guy I is, watched it. this guy is, I'm not saying that was the case yeah. with, with Alito, but, you know, this guy is marginal, this guy is weird. No, this wasn't, this wasn't Alito, it was way back farther, but hmm. uh, they Maybe used the term Maybe it was Bork or somebody, you know. They used the term uh, natural selection, okay. which would be. Yeah. Well, natural selection is a true process that we know that does work in nature. It, God uh, built it in, but natural selection doesn't take anything and move it to a higher level. Natural selection only eliminates, and it's kind of sad to say, but you know, if, if a muskrat is born with three legs, it probably won't survive, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, and of course, in the case of humans, we're made in the image of God and we protect the weak. And God says at the burning bush to uh, Moses, you know, the, the seeing eye, you know, or the, 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 the one who does not see, the one who does not hear, the one who is lame, have I not made them all for my glory? That's right. And I think that's Exodus just the, four, the, the touch, exactly, the touch of God. Um, you've spoken in Australia. Been blessed to speak there about 15 different times. Was that um, about um, intelligent design? That was the most commonly requested talk. Number two requested there and in New Zealand when we went to New Zealand was the life of C.S. Lewis and how C.S. Lewis pointed to Christ. So my wife and I, when we were given our slate of original scheduled meetings, it was 38 talks for me in two weeks. I was a little bit Put, a, put off, I mean, like, okay. And, and your wife has activities for the children. She does. Is she we, introducing them to what I call creationism? Or what you call she it? does present the case for our God and Creator from Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, and she does a fantastic job with her PowerPoints. As a matter of fact, she has music and sound effects with every slide that she uses. Oh I don't have that, so I'm, I'm, I'm a third you class. Gotta, you got to work harder. <laughs> but. You know, it gives me a thrill to think that she's out there, you know, putting that in their minds mm -hmm. right when they need it. Uh, Georgetown University, you were joined by a lot of atheists. We right? had a, an entire group of atheists come out when I spoke just a few months ago at Georgetown. That was a really delightful experience. Now, was this apologetics you were talking about? They asked me to talk on the reconciling faith and science. And so I, I, I took an approach which said basically uh, the, some people say the two are antagonistic. Mm -hmm. I think that faith enables science to take place and science encourages and supports the existence of a God who is the center, mm -hmm. specifically the Judeo-Christian Christ is the, the God-man who died for us and rose again. 
that conception of God is supported by many lines of scientific evidence. And so the two are mutually supportive, and I tried to explain that, but it wasn't until we got to the Q&A that the bomb dropped. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, what is, what is their response? Are they interested and respectful? Are they antagonistic? The, they were respectful, and it was when someone in the Q question and answer said, tell us about your story. It was then the personal, you might say, my mm -hmm. own experience, evidence of finding Christ as a, a pretty hostile and, and uh, almost uh, focused on destroying, you know, creation type of uh, antagonist. Uh -huh. When I told my story, they said, that's what really got us at the end and got us to think. And that was something that was, that was just God allowed me to share my story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's everybody listening to this program. If they're a follower of Christ, they have a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. That story is powerful evidence to the skeptic. I would love to be a fly on the wall. If you ever do anything like that around here in a university and I could sit in on the class, I, w I would just love to hear, you know, their response and all because at that level, they're supposed to be very inquisitive, very curious and looking at all sides. They often are at this point if you bring it into the focus the way we try to do without... Um, how should I say? Being without, hostile. <laughs> yeah, without being hostile, you have to be very gentle and yet, uh, you know, just encouragingly and, and positively persuasive. When you talk about the epigenome, and that's what we were talking about a while ago, that the DNA is the horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the epigenome is the rider. That's your cell, mm -hmm. uh, friends. Um, I just think of all the time King David saying, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. That is the most loaded statement. <laughs> it is. It is. And I think that we see just in the 21st century how fearfully and how wonderfully made we are. I mean, we're finding out things about the cell uh, that mm -hmm. are just astounding. The cell has the ability to take a, a, a message and then cross out certain words, substitute different words, rewrite the message. It's called text mm -hmm. editing. And what the cell does a million times a second it goes beyond the most high-speed computers that we can make. I could talk to you all day long, okay. uh, but we are, we are out of time. Mm. But I was also thinking of the scripture that in the last days knowledge would increase. Mm. I don't think we've seen anything yet. I think there's going to be it's, more and more. It's going to be fast. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fast. Mm. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And uh, like I said, I could talk to you all day long. We'll get you back. And mm. if you if you want to send some questions for Dr. Woodward, I'll I'll get him back on. But right now we're out of time. So join me next time, remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers. 